The Word of God today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And the title of the sermon is Choosing the Better. Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And the title is Choosing the Better. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to Luke, chapter 10? And it's a familiar text, but an important text, um, and a powerful one for us today in God's Word. So this is the Word of the Lord. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Amen. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, as, we, as your children are gathered in your presence, um, thank you just for another day of life. We are so incredibly privileged and blessed that we are able to gather freely, that the sun is shining, that we're able to enjoy um, who you are and what you have done in Christ on the cross, but also the fact that you gather your people together for your purpose. Would you humble us at this time? Uh, would you speak through your word and the spirit in such a powerful and eye-opening and convicting way? Um, would you continue, Lord, to do your will in this ministry, in this body, in your people, in your church? Uh, would you help us um, to not only hear, but to be transformed, to be moved in a way that is not only pleasing and obedient to you, but in a way that powerfully reflects your majesty and glory and love to those around us? God, our desire is not to grow only in number. Our desire is not to grow as a church. Our desire is, to, first and foremost, to please you. So grant us your wisdom at this time. Help us and strengthen us. Humble us where we need to be humbled. And would you give me strength and clarity as your servant? And it's your name we pray. Amen. You know, it's an interesting thing uh, when you fall for somebody. Uh, my, my wife and I, um, and I know she's anxious right now. It's not about you. It's about me, so just relax. But uh, we met in San Diego. Uh, we were at a church plant together, and she was our children's ministry pastor. And for the first four or five months, every time I asked her, hey, we need to get together to coordinate ministry things, she said, I'm really, really busy. And I said, how many nights a week do you wash your hair or do you have meetings? Like, I'm not trying to hit on you. I don't even like you. You conceited and arrogant woman. I, we need to talk about church things. And she still insisted, no, I'm really, really busy. And so we kind of hobbled our way along. And after about four or five months, uh, we had gotten to know each other. And she finally relented and allowed me to talk about church things with her. And uh, I realized at that point that privately, in my deepest heart of hearts, even in my cold heart, that I had begun to kind of be into her. Uh, the interesting thing is that at that time, uh, our church plant would go to church on Sunday, we would have service, and then they would all come over regularly to my apartment in San Diego, and we would eat. It was kind of like the Lord's Supper every Sunday, and I would cook food or we would order, but there's something that changed once I realized my feelings for her, because she was not only the children's ministry pastor, but she was also part of the church plan, she would also come over every Sunday, and I realized that as time went on, and as my feelings began to sprout a little bit, I cared more about the type of food that I was cooking and the amount of hospitality I was given to show her that I am a great potential future mate. Now, the problem with this is I'm not a great cook. I enjoy cooking. But the second thing with this is that I got so focused on figuring out the menu and making sure my house is clean and comfortable that she would come over and I would just cook and not actually talk to her and pay attention to her as much as I wanted to or perhaps could or should have. In fact, not only did I get distracted by this, but I got frustrated because the roast didn't come out as perfectly as I wanted it to. It looked nothing like it did on YouTube, or the ingredients were not as fresh as I wanted them to be. And the weird thing is that she didn't really eat too much of my cooking anyways. 
Uh, we're married today, and I can rest assured, I'm rest ass- I can rest, we can rest assured that she didn't marry me because of my hospitality. She married me because I'm incredibly handsome and capable in my life, which is a process that took like a year and a half. But that's the irony of it, isn't it? If I could go back and do it all over again, I would forget the meals. I mean, we would still gather as a church plant, have fellowship, and build community. But I would try to spend more time with her and actually get to know this woman more and more. Um, hopefully not in a creepy way. This is the tension of the text today. Mary and Martha, this whole figure, is something that's almost been caricatured in the church in the sense that even now as you're hearing about it, as you heard the word read before you, the general assumption is that Martha is a busybody and she's overly obsessed with doing things and Mary, depending on what kind of tradition you grew up in, in, as either lazy and good-for-nothing bum who's all about spiritual hippieism, Or she's this person who does the right thing and we're supposed to all be like Mary and not actually do any service or work in the church, but just supposed to read the Bible and pray. But the answer lies somewhere else entirely. Jesus and his disciples are traveling through Galilee in the area and they arrive at this little outpost, this town of Bethany. And as they get there, Mary and Martha receive him. And Martha invites Jesus and his disciples to stay at their home. Now from this we can take a couple important and powerful things. Martha is the head of the house, which is kind of uncommon for that day. A woman couldn't really own property. A woman didn't have a lot of authority or rights in that society and culture and context. But Martha was in charge of that household, meaning not only did she own the house, but she had servants and maybe even slaves, and she was responsible for the financial well-being of her own life. And Mary was her younger sister. She offers Jesus and his disciples hospitality, meaning she says that for all, as long as you are here in this, in this town, in this area, I will take on the responsibility of your well-being. I will feed you. I will give you a place to rest and relax and teach. I will be the hub where you can come and sleep and do whatever it is that you need to do. And if you've ever invited or entertained people at your house, not just for a meal, but for multiple days, this is not an easy feat. This is difficult. It's financially costly. It takes your attention away from your own life and rhythm. Jesus accepts Martha's generous invitation. He enters, and immediately, Martha is in a flurry of activity. Now, there's some debate among historians and commentaries. Is this something because Martha's a woman that all she did was domestic housework? Not necessarily. Mary and Martha, historically, are well known to be church leaders in the town of Bethany, and they were very involved in sharing the gospel and in discipling and encouraging the poor and feeding the poor and all this stuff. But in the specific context of the story today, Martha, who's invited Jesus to her home, as soon as he accepts, is busy with preparations to be hospitable. She's running around and fluffing the pillows, making sure the guest room is available. She's gathering food. Do we have olives? What kind of cheese and wine does Jesus prefer and like? Do we have that in the house? No. Oh, I got to go and buy it then. And she's, she's busy and caught up in the practical reality of trying to serve Jesus and the disciples. And this is a good thing. It's not necessarily bad. If you've ever hosted anybody, though, because you know that it can become stressful. For me, when a lot of people are coming over, even today... I get weirdly cold in my fingertips, and I get warm in my body. And my wife will tell you I am impossible to deal with, because I'm focused on the work, and I'm just like, can you just do what I ask you to do and not say anything else to me? If that's not you, you're a better person than me. And in the process of it all, she's realizing, why am I doing this all alone? Where is my sister Mary? And she pulls back the curtain from the kitchen or wherever she is, and she looks into the main gathering area, the living room area, and she sees Jesus teaching and preaching the word of God and the gospel. Her neighbors and disciples are seated around him, listening intently, and there is her younger sister Mary, who's supposed to support and help her, not merely in that room listening and not helping, but she's at the feet of Jesus, adoringly gazing upon his angelic and savior-like face. Mary's losing her cool. She's officially stressed, and now she's angry and frustrated. And she goes to Jesus. She walks into the middle of the room, 
And in front of everybody, she says to Jesus in her frustration, Lord, don't you care that I'm busy and that I'm frustrated, that I'm angry and that I'm doing this all alone to serve you and honor you and provide for you and your disciples? Tell this lazy sister to get up, stop staring at you with her mouth open, and to come help me. I love this part because I'm Martha. We're all Martha and Mary to varying degrees, but I predominantly am Martha. I can't wait to hear Jesus hear the frustration of, of Martha and to look down at Mary in loving but still judgment and say, you lazy bum, how can you invite me over to your house and not give me anything? Get up! Go help your practical and holy and loving and serving sister Martha so that I can eat a delicious banquet of a meal. I am the Lord your God. I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah and the Savior. I can totally resonate with Martha. Can you? She's trying. She's struggling. It's hard. And she's alone. But Jesus looks at Martha with compassion and with love. And we can take this because he doesn't just say, hey, Martha, and then starts talking to her, but he says tenderly her name twice. He says, Martha, my dear, dear Martha, you seem to be anxious and you seem to be troubled. It's like the understatement of the year. What's wrong? You're overwhelmed by the many things that you think you have to do in order to please me. And these two words that he uses, especially in the Greek, anxious and troubled, are not just kind of negative words, but they really, really mean you're worried, you're unstable, you're rushed, you're angry, and you're in disorder. You're messing up, or your priorities are in in disarray. Jesus is not only describing her status, but he's revealing Martha's heart. He's saying to her, "You're, you're not necessarily doing sinful things, But the reason, the more important question of why you are doing these things are in conflict with you. And you may be right practically. If you're doing something, your sister should help you. But it's not what you're doing, it's why you're doing it. And he says to her, you fail to realize that only one thing is needed, and it's me. To start out with me, to begin in the knowledge of me, to live out of my word and wisdom and the good news. Yes, your sister might be imperfect, but what she has done, what Mary has done, is she has chosen the better thing. And I will not take it away from her. In his gentle rebuke, Jesus is saying, I'm here. I'm here. I am the Lord. I am the Savior. I am the Messiah. And yes, eating and hospitality and all these things are great, but when will you ever have me in your home? And it's not an arrogant statement of, look at me, I'm important. But it's a loving statement of, I have come in the flesh to offer you hope and redemption. And you're worried about how many dishes are going to be at dinner. Who cares? Would you just be with me and hear the good news and be encouraged? Jesus is pointing out that, yes, there is much to do. But what is more important in this, in this manner? Martha's priorities are out of whack. Mary has chosen the better. What was crazy that I learned this past week was that historians and commentaries actually connect Jesus' statement, only one thing is necessary, not to Martha, but really to the food. So Jesus is now a food critic writing for the New York Times. Martha, I don't need a banquet. I don't need five dishes. I only need one dish. It's interesting, but wrong. Jesus is alluding to that fact. He's saying, you don't need to be so busy that you're creating all these dishes and perfecting your home and dousing everything in bleach for me to be here. But he's saying, your priorities are out of whack, and the one thing that's most important is you and me, and you living out of me in my grace and the wisdom of the good news. The other realization that I had is that Mary isn't lazy. Again, as I shared before, historically speaking, Martha and Mary are known to be powerful servants of the church. They are Christians who are known to be generous and practical and good and going out to constantly share the good news and serve the poor and encourage those who are struggling and suffering. Mary is not lazy. She has simply chosen what is better in the context. She knows what her priorities are. 
And she knows that at the end of the day, Jesus might not get the banquet, but Jesus will have her wholly and completely. And perhaps more importantly, she will have Jesus wholly and completely. As always, Jesus points out that the heart of the matter is the heart. The Holy Spirit today is talking about what our priorities are and whether in all of life we choose the urgency and the tyranny of this world, which is never-ending, which is human-focused, and will ultimately never satisfy and end in our destruction, or whether we are living in and out of who he is and the good news in the Word of God. There's a couple of things I want us to consider and reflect today reflect on today. The first thing is this, the reminder that, beloved, you and I are not saved by our work, but by the grace of Jesus Christ. The gospel reminds us, doesn't it? By faith you have been saved, not by works. And our faith is not placed in our ability to be good or righteous, but by the faith that Jesus, in his majesty, chose us. He chose to love us. Not because we're worthy, but because he is. He finds us in our desperation, in our brokenness, in our weakness. And no matter what you have done, no matter how unworthy you and I are, no matter the desperation that we have and the hopelessness that is our life, apart from Christ, Jesus still says, you are mine and I am yours. And this isn't just done in word, but in deed. Imagine the king of creation coming down to take on the image of nothingness, of enslavement. He takes on human flesh. And not only does he do that, but he preaches the good news of grace to us, and then he goes to the cross and suffers and willingly submits himself to die on the cross for you and I. And yet, why is it that as Christians and as a church, you and I seem to think that the more programs, the more activities, the more serving things we do, even with gritted teeth and anger and frustration and judgment of one another, has anything to do with honoring and glorifying Christ? It doesn't. Anything and everything apart from this, apart from the gospel of Jesus, leads to comparison, which is a killer. Leads to judging one another as Martha threw Mary under the bus. It leads to anger and frustration and anxiety and worry. It leads to a lack of fulfillment, a deepening of our desperation, and ultimately, beloved, it leads to death, judgment, deservedly. There is nothing that you and I do that is good apart from Christ. There's nothing that you and I do, or can hope to do, or can do, that is apart from Christ that can be good. The grace of the gospel is not only that Jesus chooses to love us and redeems us on the cross, but on that cross we are now saved and have the freedom to live in and out of the word, the good news, and his example of love. But it starts with Jesus. Can you imagine, and and I've I've shared this before, but can you imagine, think of somebody that you love the most in your life. A spouse, a parent, a friend, I don't know, whoever. Hopefully they love you back. But can you imagine doing things for them but not actually learning about them? Is that love? Can you imagine saying to someone, you're my best friend and I'm your best friend, and they constantly betray you, even though the words that they say might be loving and loyal? Is that a best friend? Is that friendship in general? And yet, why is it that when it comes to our relationship with Christ, we say we want to do things for Christ, we want to do Christ-like things, we want to know a lot of things about him, and yet we are unwilling, unable, and rebellious to the point where we don't actually desire love and know him first. Second point is that we were created... It's not something that we just have to do, but we were created to live out of intimacy with Christ. We were created to live out of intimacy with Christ. The nature of Adam and Eve, the perfect man and woman, was not that they would be the gardeners or zookeepers of God. That was secondary. They were created to glorify God and to know and enjoy him forever. They took walks with him. They marveled at God's creation and creativity and mercy. They knew him desperately and intimately and personally. Nothing apart from God is good. 
We were created to be this way. And yet you and I are Martha's in the sense that we're caught up in trying to accomplish things for him. And yet, again, we don't know, love, or want him first. Now, this isn't a perfectly accomplished thing, but we learn to do this. This is the process of sanctification, right? We grow, we learn when we humbly lay ourselves at the foot of the cross and we say, Lord, as you will and not as I will, you are greater, you are everything, you are all. Thank you for loving me. And would you take over? Would you guide, would you lead, would you convict, and would you inspire? It's like trying to be satisfied by a picture of steak or dim sum or whatever your food is and not actually eating the food that you are trying to be satisfied by. We were created to be intimate with Christ. Finally, the last point I want to share with you is that a true disciple is one who accepts and chooses Christ in every, in every part of life. Now I know that there's, there can be a danger here about person-oriented faith, but in faith, our responsibility is then to respond to the gospel in faithfully and obediently choosing and surrendering to Christ over everything of this world, and perhaps more importantly for us, against even the broken desires of our own heart. It doesn't mean that we don't act in love and all sit at home and read the Bible and sing Kumbaya and only pray. Remember, right before this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is the prime example of horizontal love and acting as reflections of God's grace to one another. Now, this is done intentionally by Luke. The Good Samaritan reminds us, if you are Christ's followers, if you accept his love for you, if it is real, if there's gratitude, if there's joy in the fact that you have hope in the salvation of the good news of Jesus Christ, then it's evidence in the way, not thought of, not known, or not believed in your heart, but it's evidence in the way of how you live and love one another. Don't tell me you love me, and then act differently. And here, in the example of Martha and Mary, we return to the vertical relationship with God then. Everything that the Good Samaritan does is not because he is an inherently good person, but because Christ is Lord. And because he intimately loves, knows, and chooses to obey and surrender to him, that is why he loves perfectly, even those who are called his enemies and who hate him in return. And in this example we see how we are to vertically live in our relationship and intimacy with Christ. Is he the first love? This is the condemnation of the church in Revelation 2, isn't it? Jesus speaking to the church, he says, listen, you're a great church. You have good theology. You're nice to poor people. You're nice to losers and awkward people. You share the gospel kind of, and you do all these things. On every practical level, you are a good and decent church. But I have one judgment of you, and this one judgment disqualifies everything that you do you think is Christian. You have forgotten me as your first love. It's nice that you're doing things. It's nice that you care. It's nice that you're trying. But it means nothing because your heart is in disorder. You're serving out of human effort and intention. Emmanuel, our actions should not and must not supersede or be more important than our love and desire for Christ first. He must be our first love. He must be what feeds our souls what convicts our hearts, and what compels us to go and live, ironically, as disciples of Jesus Christ. Apart from this, even with our best intentions on our best day, with our best efforts, they're nothing. They're nothing. No wonder we're stressed. We're running around. We're trying to do all these things to accomplish to order, to, in order to please God. But in the midst of it all, we actually forget to actually agree to engage with and love and obey God first. The irony is that perhaps we want to do godly things and things about God rather than actually loving him and wanting to be loved by him first. And you know what's crazy? There's some of you, including myself in this place, where it, uh, my response to some of this, especially with Martha, is it's not fair. But at least I'm trying. How many times have I prayed, even in my year and a half at Emmanuel Presbyterian Church of San Jose? God, it's so frustrating. 
I'm trying, though. I'm trying to love. I'm trying to prepare to preach. I'm trying to organize. I'm trying to encourage and build up leaders. I'm trying, at least. My goodness, at least honor that. They're not trying. Of course, it's not you in this room. They is faceless. I'm, I'm doing better than they are. I wish they would join and follow my example. But the response every time I get, in God's word, especially in Luke 10, and the response every time I get in the conviction of the Holy Spirit is, I don't care what you do. I care about who you love first. All your frustrations with people, all your frustrations with structure, with leadership, with organization, it's done out of your own personal arrogance and pride. Don't label it Jesus and think that that's what makes the difference. Are you submitted first to me? What's really cool in that conviction, though, is that lesson that even in our arrogance, even in our brokenness, and even in our vanity, Martha learns that even in her sinfulness and in her disorder, she can still tell God. I think that's a beautiful and powerful and generous thing. Martha is still able to share her frustrations with Jesus and to confess her anger. And the amazing thing is that Jesus, even though she publicly interrupted him, teaching the disciples and the neighbors, he still responds with mercy. And he says, Martha, my beloved and my dear Martha. And he corrects her gently, but he does discipline her. Emmanuel, Jesus is not calling us to all become mystics who live in the wilderness and do nothing but pray and read the Bible. You and I are called to be agents of renewal. We're called to infiltrate every facet and sphere of humanity and reality and creation and existence for the glory of God. The question isn't the work to be done, because there is work to be done, but the question that challenges us today is before we do the work, where is our heart? Where are our priorities? I think it's incredible that not only at this church, but that there are Christians all over the world that refuse to serve or refuse to obey the simple gospel mandate to participate in the body of Christ simply because they don't like somebody at the church. Or I don't like the pastor, or I don't like a decision, so I'm going to stop tithing. Or I'm not going to show up as a silent, passive-aggressive protest to what I don't agree with about this church, or I'm going to leave because of a frivolous, non-gospel, or central Christian issue. And yet, that doesn't actually harm the church, because God has his church, and he will do whatever he wants with the church. Whether it's me here, or you here, or not, God will, have, God will preserve his church. But what it reveals is Martha's heart in us. Our priorities are out of order. And especially in those circumstances, and perhaps more, that means that what we're actually worshiping is not God, but it's ourselves. And here's the final thing. I'm trying to incorporate this Apple thing. One last thing. The thing that really blew me away this week was not Jesus' rebuke of Martha, but at the end of the day, if we listen to what Jesus is talking about, your priorities are out of order. What we realize then is that Martha's problem is not that she's busy or angry and frustrated. I mean, those are issues. But her main problem was that she was so easily bothered and distracted and thrown off because she didn't cling to Christ. And that's a powerful reminder for us. Jesus tells us, doesn't he? Let me, let me try to hold it together for a second. Hold on. Jesus tells us that it won't be easy. He tells us that in this world you will have trouble you will fail. That not only the world will be against you, but that even people, people that call you maybe even brother and sister, will betray you or cause you intentional ill will and harm. But he says to the disciples immediately after, but take heart, be courageous, be bold, and continue in faithfulness. Why? Because I have already overcome the world. And I will be with you forever. If we can cling to the promise of the gospel, if we believe what the word of God says, if we live in and out of the promise of Jesus Christ, then the, the, the defining nature of that person, loved and called by God, is faithful perseverance despite whatever may come. It is. It's not just pride 
It's not just gritting your teeth and moving forward. It's remembering the grace of Jesus Christ and not being thrown off or distracted or easily troubled. And yet, beloved, for you and I, we are so easily thrown off of the perch, of the calling, the identity, and the purpose, and the hope that the gospel of Jesus Christ offers us. And why is that? Because he is not our first love. Because our priorities are off whack. Mary's main, Martha's main problem was that she was easily distracted and discouraged. If we are not anchored in the eternal personhood and work of Jesus Christ, we will be easily swayed, we will be easily knocked down, and we will be easily defeated. And beloved, as the Holy Spirit speaks and convicts our hearts today in the word, it's my encouragement that we would remember that Christ has chosen to love us, and he has called us his own on the cross, and he invites us not to perform for us, but to know, love, and enjoy him forever. Let's pray together. Before we close uh, with a song of response, um, would you come before our Heavenly Father in humility? Would you consider in reflection where your priorities are in life right now? Not just in the overarching ideal of the gospel and who Jesus is, but in every part of your lives. Remember that Christ is Lord and his sovereignty rules over every ounce and part of creation. So in your marriages, in your work, in your finances, as a parent, as a child, as a spouse, whatever it might be, are your priorities first and foremost the glory and the grace of Jesus Christ? And if not, would you confess that before him today? Would you lay that down in humility, trusting in the gracious response of Jesus to call you to return to him and that we would not be easily destroyed or defeated and distracted. Would you take some time and come before our Heavenly Father now in prayer? Let's pray. Father, we are a people that have been incredibly blessed. We have been given so much. Maybe it's not material, but especially in the good news of the cross of Jesus, we have been given the riches of heaven and the generosity of the Creator. And yet we confess that our priorities have been warped by our own brokenness. We have bought into the lies of this world where we think that as long as we do Christ-like or Christian things, it's okay, and we have forgotten our first love in you. And because we have forgotten that, our priorities, our desires have been disordered, and we are constantly living lives of quiet desperation that are defined by uncertainty, frustration, biting one another, brokenness, anger, lashing out. Lord, would you convict your people at this time according to your grace, just as you responded to Martha with tenderness and compassion, but also with truth. Would you help us not to be so easily distracted? 
Would you help us to cling to you first and foremost and remind us that you truly are the one treasure that really is in existence and that out of that promise, that belief and faith as you offer it to us, that all we have is you, that out of that, that everything else will be defined and will take care of itself because of who you are. Help us to trust you. Help us to see clearly. And Lord, help us to continue in the process of surrendering to the Holy Spirit, saving, redeeming, maturing, and sanctifying us to become more like you in all things. And not just for us, Lord, that through us that you would be able to be revealed and shown and that your love would be experienced by how you call us as a church, as a people, and as your sons and daughters. Thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are here with us. And thank you that even now that your mercy is more. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.